Hi, everybody. I'm Sunny, and this is We Gotta Talk, a live weekly digital talk show and podcast where we like to dig deep. Real talk, big topics. Now, let's dig in. Hey, everybody, welcome to this episode of We Gotta Talk. I'm Sunny, and I'm really glad you're here with me today. So listen, guys, we, you know, on this show, we have a a broad range of topics we like to cover. And I think what is really special about today's show is that even though it's difficult material, this is must know information for parents. So if I can encourage you to stay with me through this episode, what I promise you will get when you walk away is practical information on keeping your kids safer online, which feels impossible. But today's guest is here to provide us with with some great information. Today's guest is Carly Yost. She is the founder and CEO of Child Rescue Coalition. This group is a nonprofit, and essentially what they've done is develop technology that they in turn give to law enforcement to use to prevent sexual exploitation of children online that often starts in interactions between predators and children right there sadly, in people's homes, on social media, uh, on phones, even on gaming consoles. You're going to be shocked when you hear the places that these predators can access your children. So stick with me. Please, if you're watching live, drop in any questions you guys might have, because I want this to be helpful to you. I want this to be um, interactive and something where you feel like you can actually get some great information. So let's welcome Carly onto the show. Carly, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you, Sunny, for having us. You do a job, Carly, that a lot of people would whew, have to take a few deep breaths every day going into the office, too, but it is vital work. We are in an online world, and you more than anyone probably see the impact, the negative impact that this can have on kids. What is one sort of, um, I don't want to call it a pitch, but an opening thought or something when you tell people what you do for a living, why you say it's necessary? Tell us about Child Rescue Coalition. Yeah, um, I feel like you did such a great job introducing us. Um, but really, as you mentioned, at the core of what we do is the technology that we provide to law enforcement that's able to identify child predators that we see all over the globe. Um, really, law enforcement is doing a wonderful job. They're trying to keep up with identifying all these predators, uh, but it's almost too big of a job for them to handle alone. And so they rely on technology like ours which helps them identify who these predators are, who's trading the most amount of content, and and really try to rank and prioritize who the worst of the worst offenders are. Um, Because unfortunately, there's just too many of them online to even be going after all of them. So it's really a a matter of just trying to scratch the surface and get to the worst ones. But it is, we're a nonprofit organization. It's free technology we provide to law enforcement all with the purpose of trying to protect and rescue children. So when you started this company, I want you to sort of, uh, not company, nonprofit, tell us the inspiration and the reason behind it. And and I want to note that, guys, this is sort of like an ongoing relationship that Carly and her group have with with law enforcement. So when she's talking about this technology they're developing, I mean, they're in contact. And if any, you know, I I know that you guys have a really hands-on approach. So I do want to get to how it specifically works. But tell us how Child Rescue Coalition came about in the first place. Yeah. Well, we shifted to a nonprofit 10 years ago. Uh, We're actually celebrating our 10th year as Child Rescue Coalition and and a nonprofit. Um, But this technology was developed originally by a brilliant team of law enforcement um, who realized that they were able to identify these predators and were taking leads all around the world and realized it was almost too big of a problem to be able to be handling alone, that they needed resources, they needed help, they needed Mm -hmm. funding to be able to do this project. And so actually, I would say about 15 years ago, my my father got really passionate about it. Um, He was a brilliant technologist himself, uh, built a lot of companies and technologies that helped revolutionize the way law enforcement do their investigations. But his biggest passion uh, was child protection. He sat Mm -hmm. on the board of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, uh, really good friends with John and Rave Walsh, um, and just taught us growing up uh, that really there's no more important cause to be fighting for and to Mm -hmm. be 
to be passionate about. Um, so it's something I really share as well. So actually, you know, my father passed away uh, 10 years. Well, no, now it's been 11 years ago. So he had brought this project to the South Florida area and completely funded it uh, and really make, made a lot of advancements to the technology. And so when he passed away, my sister and I, uh, working with that, that team of law enforcement, that team of technologists said it's too important, you know, for this not to really thrive, get bigger, for us to truly build a true coalition uh, behind this technology. And we thought it made so much sense to put it into a nonprofit, keep the technology free and available. And it's really been amazing. We went from officers using this technology in about 30 countries to now expanded to in 97 countries where we've trained investigators wow. around the world. And I think people have really just embraced this as being a nonprofit, which is what we transitioned to 10 years mm -hmm. ago. I love that you keep the platform free and open to whoever's able and interested in using it. I, I should have mentioned this at the top, Carly, but this is remarkable because of the tools that you guys developed. Law enforcement has rescued over 3,300 children from sexual exploitation. They've arrested more than 14,300 predators, often including those in positions of trust, which is something I want to get into too, is that um, the way that we're thinking about child sexual abuse is is different now with education out there. We're starting to realize that often ones closest to children are the ones producing this content and trading on it and developing these awful sort of um, underworlds of content. Can, can you dive into that part of it for us? And I know it's going to feel uncomfortable for those of us who aren't used to listening to this type of stuff, but, um, but I really want people to know the genesis of this problem, where it's actually starting and what your technology has shown you where abuse often starts. So can you shine a light on that for us? Yeah, as you mentioned, oftentimes it's someone who has access to that child, maybe someone within their own family or a very close friend, family, trusted member of that family circle. Um, and unfortunately, that's kind of how predators work as they groom the family first and then the child second. Uh, it's someone who has access to that child on a regular basis and more horrific than just the abuse, uh, which is the most horrific part of it is abusing these children, but that many of these predators are filming, vi videotaping, taking images of this abuse and putting it on the internet to be traded with other predators. So on a daily basis, we see new content being discovered, new content being shared. And uh, it's it's worse than often people even think. It's very young victims and it's very you know, violent sexual abuse of these children. And, and to me, it's just the, the officers know it, we know it all too well. Um, these are dangerous offenders who need to be investigated. And so our mission continues to be, let's just do more and more about it. When you got into, you know, take sort of taking on your father's legacy and, and continuing on this work, how do you keep yourself motivated to continue to go in and and also the law enforcement officers that are closest to this material that unfortunately part of their job involves identifying the material and identifying then the perpetrators um that's got to be tough carly yeah and they have it much worse than i do than a lot of us do on our team so fortunately at child rescue coalition we we don't have to view content. We never, we don't even host or, or, you know, store imagery because it would be illegal for us to do so. We're not law enforcement. And so anyone in possession of these files are, are committing a felony. Luckily, we're able to identify the trade of it through other um, technology that we have and, and other ways besides, <laughs> besides hosting it or viewing it. Um, so that's, very good for us and our team. What is so difficult is these investigators who not only do they have to identify who the predators are, they have to go in and collect all the evidence, review the evidence, interview to see if 
potential victims speak to children that were abused, hear the, the graphic stories of their abuse. And it really takes a toll on these investigators. So often that we see a lot of time it, it people will r rotate out of this type of crime type because it becomes too much for them. Mm -hmm. They actually have to get mental health check-ins and, and do retreats um, because it, it can be so tolling. It's a, it takes such a toll mm -hmm. on them mentally. Uh, the good part of what we do is we get to hear a lot of the the success that comes out of it. So hearing from those investigators that a child was rescued, hearing that our technology made a difference and identified a really dangerous predator. And so look, luckily we kind of are shielded from a lot of the, the negativity that those investigators see and we get to be part of the, the positive impact. I think what a lot of parents are most surprised to learn when they maybe hear about the work you do, or for example, a, a while back, I interviewed a survivor of um, a luring and a kidnapping and a sexual assault. And she was, it was like a doors knocked down rescue by the FBI mission. I mean, it was very intense. Her name was Alicia Kozak and Alicia Kozakevich, but Kozak is the name she goes by online. Um, and I think parents don't realize how easily predators can access the minds of children online. So say it's not happening within the home, but there's a point of contact through a gaming console or social media. Can you speak to the patterns of these predators and sort of reinforce for us too, because we need this reminder of sadly, how easy it is for these people to gain access to our children, like knock some sense into us here. Yeah. Well, that was it. I mean, for so long, we would uh, warn parents, we still do, about who's trying to gain access and private uh, alone time with your child. And this is in real life, you know, who's trying to groom a relationship with your child that, that you know, you might need to look into more. Um, but the online world has made this problem just so much more difficult where you can even talk to children where you, and they're agreeing with you that they won't speak to people they don't know online. And it just becomes all too comfortable when it's someone that they're playing a game with online or someone that starts to feel like a friend that they've developed this relationship with. And it's really where we're seeing predators the most is where children go. So online social media platforms and gaming platforms. It's it's where predators know that they can find easily find children and develop those relationships with them, which is typically how predators start. They start by trying to be nice and be friendly to that child and and see what they can get away with and 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 push those limits. Um, but definitely, what we're seeing is you know people predators online asking children for images, um, you know, asking them for personal information and just taking it from there where it's eventually asking them to, to meet in person and mm -hmm. trying to convert that from online abuse to real life abuse. And it, it's alarming. It's so alarming. That's what happened to this, this girl that I interviewed. And, and, you know, it's, it's easy to think, okay, well, my kid wouldn't fall for that. Or, you know, he's 13 now he, there's no way he, I, it is shocking to me what how these people are able to communicate in a way that makes them feel younger. You know, oftentimes, like you said, they're posing as people who are your kid's age. Um, I don't want to like freak out about it too much because it's one of those issues, Carly, that it's like it, it can consume you when you think about the many access points that our kids have to potential predators. But what do you say to parents then who want to be proactive and who, who know and realize that we exist in a world of technology, but who want to arm their kids, let's say from a young age to react appropriately, because it's that fine line between sharing information and not scaring them. So can you give us a few talking points that your group suggests that we can even start with our kids now? Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it all varies from what age your child is. So it's how you how you communicate with them. So from a very early young age, you can start talking about, you know, that there are tr tricky or, um, you know, people who want to trick you online, mm -hmm. tending to be someone that they're not, all the way up to as they get older and, and even, you know, age 10, maybe even younger, um, having the communications about, 
not if a predator contacts you, but but most likely when they do. And then arming the child of, you know, what's appropriate that you're the parents not are not gonna shame them for for letting uh, for that child telling their parent. Um, we just actually released something on our social media, which was uh, responses that you can arm your child with if someone's asking them for their picture or, you know, inappropriate relationship. It's just, or um, ways to arm that child with talking points of how to mm-hmm. say no, how to shut that down, how to, you know, you know arm them. Because I think it's, it's the kids who, you know, just haven't had that open communication to know that it it's most likely they are going to be approached. That's one of the biggest things I think we don't think about is, and a prosecutor said this to me, is predators cast a wide net. They are not, you know, going after one child. And to that child, it might feel like, wow, they see this person showing me so attention, so much attention, you know, feels special or you know they're that's what predators try to do well is make that kid feel special feel uh give them attention that they're looking for and but really predators are casting a wide net and the the ones that don't respond to them they move on to the ones that do they're looking for that child that responds to that and is giving more to it so as much as you can educate your children to shut it down report it not engage, the better. Do you remember any of those one-liners offhand? I, I would assume, of course, like silence is always the best option, sort of log off or sign off or don't even directly address the person back. Because I'm, I'm sort of thinking of the games that my kids play that allow for interaction. And it's like Roblox, Fortnite, um, even some of the sports games, you know, where the, where the kids wear the headphones, you know, they're talking back and forth. So do you remember any of those quick one-liners or specific things that kids can say just so we can get those out there? And then we will link to the manuals and the other materials that you guys have provided as well in show notes. Yeah, sure. So, and this is a con content that was created for it's not certainly if a graphic predator is abusing you how to respond because that response right. would be not engaged I, I would encourage parents don't delete anything you 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 don't talk to the predator and you report it to law enforcement right away you so maintain you know a, a record of, of what they said online don't engage with the predator and report that to law enforcement or to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children as well. I would do both. Um, but this was if maybe someone's asking you to set, set asking a teen, young teen to take a picture or they want a bathing suit photo or something that you're, you're just really uncomfortable with. You know, some of the, it was actually one of our investigators did a, a video of um, sending just a funny picture that's saying, you know, not interested and I roll you know, or you know, maybe they say, "Will you take your phone into your bedroom so we could have a private conversation?" And having those convers- um, talking points to say, "You know, my parents don't allow it. I would be, you know, uh, grounded if I didn't." Just anything that takes the the pressure off the child, and you can mm-hmm. arm them with things that they could say. Ultimately, you know, disengaging from that conversation and not continuing to engage with that predator. But it was interesting to, you know, I remember in high school hearing from a, uh, a dare person that, it, you know, if you didn't want to smoke pot, you could give the answer of, um, you know, that you have to do drug tests. You, you know, it was just something to arm someone with. They didn't mm-hmm. know how they know themselves. So it's a way to say, no, you know, my parents won't allow me to do this. And, and, and I can't. Are you able to share what your technology has shown to be the most common platforms where predators reach out? And if you could name some of them, that would be amazing. Um, I mean, we we definitely see that it's it's not necessarily all the platforms that are doing something wrong. It's it's really the predators go to where the children are. Right. Um, so there is a lot of you know, there's children using games like Roblox, Mine, Minecraft. Um, we we see a lot of predators using that kind of content because they know that that young children are there. Um, 
and it's a way to talk with them. So I, I do encourage parents to go on our website, which is childrescuecoalition.org and download our CRAM manual, which teaches them. You can go on. We have pictures of how you turn off chat within those games, how you make it. So you have to know a person before they can friend request you or even completely shut off uh, friend requesting capabilities. And I think you can get away with that when they're young. As kids get older, they're, they're going to be online where there's chat components. It's probably mm -hmm. going to happen. So it's, it's, in, it's uh, informing those kids with, with what's appropriate, what's inappropriate. Uh, but also the social media platforms. So, you, you know, we're seeing Snapchat, Instagram, uh, others where predators directly look for children that target underage children and posing certainly as people they are not and trying to uh, lure those, these children um, and even uh, force them to do things that they're uncomfortable with, which is frightening. You know, what really scare the heck out of me are these news headlines that come out where it's revealed the predator threatens the safety of the child's family. If you don't send me a picture, if you don't send me a video, I'm going to come to your house and X, Y, Z. I mean, it is so dark and twisted. And I was not aware, Carly, that these predators are getting even more uh, sort of direct and aggressive. And it's not just a nudge. You're like, hey, well, it's like a threat. Um, and, and our kids, as we know, I mean, their brains aren't even fully developed. They don't know how to process the fact that that's an empty threat. And they're terrified of things like, you know, being kidnapped or their families being hurt. It just feels like such a, uh, I just, I hate that we have to even have this conversation. Our kids are being asked to take on so much emotionally and mentally these days, but I'm sure you see plenty of that in the work you do too, where these kids say, Hey, I, I didn't even know that I could not do that because they said they would X, Y, Z if I didn't. Yeah. That's why I mean, I really believe if we can, if parents can have those conversations before that predator, you know, says anything along mm -hmm. those lines, makes those threats of, you know, you can't tell this secret because like have those conversations with your kids. There should be no secret that mm -hmm. you can't tell me, tell someone, a trusted person, um, you know, there's nothing that this person online should force you to send money, force you to say, send nude images like always you can feel like you can bring that to me and we'll mm -hmm. report it the right way and do mm -hmm. the right thing about it what's been the what's been the biggest hurdle in preventing exploitation and i know that your technology sort of identifies what's happening but on the prevention side what's a big hurdle that you've come across yeah i think the biggest hurdle uh really just is the amount of predators unfortunately that we see so the amount of data that we we sit on within our technology. Uh, there's millions and millions of IP addresses that we've seen trading an illegal child sexual abuse image, image or video. And there's not millions of investigators that are doing this kind of crime type. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you hear a lot about people being arrested, law enforcement who focus on this crime type are doing amazing work. They really are heroes that are so passionate about protecting every child um, and wish that they could rescue every single one of them. But unfortunately, we're just scratching the surface at this mm -hmm. problem. It's, it's so big and such a big scale. And it, I really wish, um, you know, our government, our, our politicians would say, I know we're doing a lot already, but we need to be doing more. We need to fund more law enforcement to be focusing on this. We need to really put an emphasis on this crime type. Uh, enough is enough. That was going to be my next question, actually, is, um, you know, in your work on this side of things, what do you think remains to be done legis legislatively or legally to, to not only help find these predators, but to properly punish them? Because we've all come across a headline or two where we see some of the sentencing for these awful people and it's two months or it's you know, 16 months behind, it just doesn't feel appropriate to the crime that was committed. So what do you hope changes on that side of things? Or what do you see even moving toward change? Yeah, I feel like uh, that I'm 
kind of in a bubble here in South Florida where we, we really do love Florida in general. We see very strong sentences for child predators. Um, so I, I feel good about that, that they are sentencing them in appropriate ways. Mm -hmm. But it varies so much state to state. You could see one state that's, you know, really giving uh, probation time even for what you would see here in Florida. They're getting really strong sentences and mm -hmm. many, many years in jail. Um, and it really varies uh, country to country. So I, I am encouraged to see that more countries, more law enforcement is taking this crime so seriously. And, and I, I believe that legislation is catching up with that where, you know, people want to see that they're appropriately serving time for their crime. Tell us about how the technology works. And, you know, obviously you don't have to get into specifics, but I would imagine it's something that has to be constantly updated. So you, you know, technology moves very rapidly and develops very rapidly. So uh, how does it work and, and how do you guys keep it effective and up to date? Yeah. Um, well, we have a brilliant team of technologists who are just amazing. Uh, it's also um, people on our team, like our president, Bill Wolte, who is former law enforcement himself, who's really connected to law enforcement around the globe, uh, who they give us feedback of where our predators moving, where are new areas of the internet where we're seeing people trading. And then he's communicating that with our technology team, who's building into those areas of the internet as we see predators are kind of moving about. Um, but, but simply at the core of how our technology works, we were able to identify a computer. So we don't know a name or an address. We can't say you know, this X, Y, and Z person is a child predator. We know a computer and we know their IP address was in possession of this felony level file that law enforcement has viewed and categorized to us as known child sexual abuse material. And so when, once we know it's a felony level image, we're able to start looking for IP addresses around the globe that are advertising that they're in possession of that file. So they're online, they're in these public forums of the internet. So we're we're not hacking computers. We're not hacking like private areas of someone's internet. These predators are going to public online forums. They're in possession of a legal of an illegal file, and they're making it available for distribution. So they're in possession, but they're also making it available for other predators to download from them. Um, so it's it's very public venues of the internet, and the way our tool works is by every time we see that IP address trading one illegal file, we, we built a profile, if you will, on, on that computer. And so then law enforcement is able to log in and, and see in their jurisdiction how many offenders we've seen online, who's trading the most amount of files. They can even see in like what age range of victims that that predator is trading. And it's up to law enforcement at that point of how many they go after who they choose to go after and which which predators they want to build a case against. It's sad because that leaves, you know, so many people on the table still who are doing this. I mean, you know, because yeah. it's just but you're right. The reality is, like you said, the teams aren't large enough. It doesn't exist enough manpower to actually prosecute and go after all of these all of these people. That's pretty intense. What about how you keep it? current too. I mean, as you're moving forward, is the goal to grow the group or is the goal to, and I'm sure you have a ton of interaction too with local law enforcement. So are we trending in the direction where even each local PD will have a unit assigned to this, do you think? Uh, yep. And so we work closely. Uh, every state has what they call a internet crimes against children task force. And so we work closely uh, with all of them where they know about our technology. We've we've trained in every state in the United States, um, and so so yeah. Anywhere that that has a task force, a, a local agency might be affiliated with an Internet Crimes Against Children task force. They should hopefully know about our technology and know that it's available to them. But as I mentioned to you before, it's a crime type where you do see rotation. You see 
you know, people, new people moving into it, new investigators. And there's always room for us to expand how many people know about us to make sure that they know our technology is free and available and hopefully encourage them to get trained in using our tool. You guys posted something on Instagram of note a couple of days ago, and I talked about this as well briefly on social media, the Dalai Lama incident. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to revisit the grisly details, but it's just, it was something gross. And I think the, the sort of lesson or the thought behind the post, and I think everyone had this sort of reaction too, is that literally anyone can be a predator. And there are people, and, and this sort of goes back to the point you were saying before, where predators are often closest to children, whether that be in relationship or proximity. Um, you know, this here is an example of someone in an exalted position who people revere spiritually and who follow, you know, he has followers. And like, I don't want to be negative Nelly over here, Carly, but it's an illustration of how real the threat of exploitation is even at a more minute level that this might have been, but does it, does, does it blow your mind sometimes? Like how much we have to protect our kids from this kind of stuff? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it does. And, you know, I'm a mom myself and, uh, you know, sometimes I feel, you know, am I, am I too paranoid? Am I, you know, always kind of gauging scenarios, but then I have to remind myself, you know, you can't stop you from living life. You're mm -hmm. going to have people you trust in your life. You want to have good relationships for your children and positive influences in your life. Um, but I think always keeping a, a mindful eye of, um, you know, are there people who might be using power, influence, positions of trust, you know, and are they trying to have alone time with my child or, you know, have things that, I wouldn't approve of. So, mm -hmm. so I, I think you can't drive yourself crazy as a parent. You, you have to do the best that you can, but it's certainly, I think good to always, you know, have, have a, a thought in your head of just making sure you are protecting them. Right. And, and part of that these days is being aware of how we post our children online, which to us may seem innocent or, you know, the farthest thing from provocative. But um, I know you guys have an opinion too on posting kids on social media. I interviewed a really interesting woman a few weeks back. Her name on Instagram is Mom Uncharted, and her mission is to stop parents not only from posting what could be perceived as inappropriate pictures online, whether that's, you know, I don't know, a bathing suit picture, or whatever, but also um, sort of making money off of our children's images and the exploitation that exists even in that form. So talk a little bit about that too, this pause before you post movement that really seems to be gaining steam. Yeah. So we launched pause before you post, gosh, a number of years ago now, but it really, it's started the conversation for us with other parents of, you know, it's not just about predators who go online to trade images, but, you know, what are we sharing ourselves? That's a little bit too much detail, sharing too much, revealing too much skin, that bathing suit photo, even people go as far, you, you think it's not going to happen, but they're sharing bath time images and, you know, complete <laughs> naked pictures and doing so in a, just because they don't look at it the same way a predator would. And, and so right. I think we all know people who share too much on social media. We've seen these people, but let's make sure we're not sharing too much of our children. Um, so certainly no nudity, even bathing suit photos, but then to go beyond that too, don't post pictures that show your schools. If they have a uniform, mm -hmm. the school name, don't, don't post the location or even what sports team they're on. It's just, let's not put this information out there because there are predators. Even if you have a closed social media network, they could be finding out more information about your children than you want. Well, that's, that's what's my next question is in your, in your work and in some of the sort of combing back through old cases, have you ever seen a case where a child was able to be targeted or located because of something as innocuous as say a post of with their school uniform on or with an identifying piece of information? Like, is that happening in real life? Yeah. So we actually spoke to an investigator here in Florida who had known about a predator who had seen pictures of the jersey of a soccer team. The, the predator 
took the leap to go so far to like Google what is this team figured out what school that that child went to um, and that they created a fake account to look like a student who also went to that school. And so, oh so certainly we're seeing that, you know, predators, they get information where, because, you know, sometimes we're sharing just too much and might not even be thinking of it in that way. Uh, it is one of those things that you, you, like you said, you can really overthink and really take to the max. And, you know, I, I try not to be like preachy on this platform or ever, because I, I do recognize that parents are going to do things differently. And, you know, while I may have chosen to share just this portion of my kid's life, I never want to make a parent feel like bad about maybe decisions they've made even in the past about sharing things. But like we're having hard conversations with our kids, we do need to have hard conversations with ourselves now. Like when it, it might be too much now. And, and I do, I do think we will look back on this period of time as not shameful per se, because there is a lot to be gained in sharing things, our experiences, for example, about motherhood and raising children. But I know that I personally come back to a lot of the times, okay, what is Sunny? 50 years, 50, 15 years from now, going to think about having shared this. I mean, you really have to be hard on yourself too, as a parent and constantly, constantly like go back and reassess the way you're doing things, you know? Yeah. I, I look back to, you know, when to posting pictures of, of my children and, and I felt like pressure to do it because of family members, they were like, why aren't you sharing more? We want to see it. Mm -hmm. And I look back and think, you know, did I really want to post her? Was I feeling like this pressure because people wanted to, you know, aunts and grandparents wanted to see the newest baby picture. But I, looking back, I think I could have just sent them those pictures. I didn't need to, you know, have them all on online and certainly take the pictures, share the pictures. There's apps where you can invite family members only. Um, it doesn't have to be on social media. So it's almost like, you know, we kind of feel this pressure. Everyone's doing it. You have to. Yeah, of. you do. And I mean, shamefully, most of the most engaged with content online is like a, a kid focus, you know, whether it's a cute moment or a funny thing. You're, and listen, I've been guilty of this before too. So this isn't like a judgment moment, but you know, something funny my kid said, or like even capturing audio, like something funny that they're not even, like, we've all done it. But I, I do think part of this conversation especially when we hear about the sheer number of predators that you're finding online, there has to be now, not only what can we tell our kids, but what can we ask ourselves to do better? Um, I, I want to cover this too, before we let you go, Carly, the, um, how predators are searching hashtags on social media. Can you talk about how they're locating some of this material? And, and also to add on the question of, are they taking these, what we think are innocent posts of our kids, are they grabbing them and sharing them from Instagram and trading those too, which is a fear that I know a lot of parents have. Can you talk about that whole thing? Yeah. Yeah. So let me start there. Um, are they taking images? And, and yes, we have heard from law enforcement that within a collection of illegal child sexual abuse material, that they'll also find just many, many images of other people's children unknown to that predator. So, you know, they're getting them from online. They're getting them from pictures people are sharing. That's not particularly what we are interested in and looking for because they're probably not illegal images. Like even the bath time photo is not to the level that we're we're looking into and that people are being prosecuted against mm -hmm. totally. I don't know a better word than creepy of why a predator would also have, you know, other people's children that they don't know stored in these same images of all this highly illegal sexual abuse material. So we do know that they're taking pictures, grabbing them um, from other, other places. And yes, you mentioned the hashtag and that was part of our kids for privacy campaign was that people are, are over sharing or they're they're posting inappropriate images and that they, they were using hashtags which we were seeing and we were trying to flood with uh, privacy please signs encouraging parents to encourage privacy and to pause before you post but we were seeing things like hashtag bath time fun hashtag 
um, you know, potty time, hashtag, you know, bikini baby, you know, where there was then it was create it was searchable, indexed images of, you know, really kind of to sharing, oversharing that parents were engaging in. And um, we were just really trying to emphasize, let's, let's pause before you post. Let's create pr privacy for these children who really don't have a voice to ask for it themselves. And let's not have searchable areas of the internet where predators could easily go to find, you know, it might not be felony level imagery, but it's images that they're interested in. What is one thing you want to leave parents with? Um, I know we've covered a lot of practical tips from going through your CRAM handbook, which guys, we will link in show notes. And that's the booklet that, or the online um, book that shows you specific ways to, for example, uh, you know, shut down conversations and, and gaming systems or apps and stuff. So we'll have all that for you. But what do you want to leave parents with before we wrap up that will help them truly keep their kids a little bit safer? Yeah. I do, even though it's, you know, how big of a problem this is and how scary and overwhelming and dark of a topic, this is, you know, Child Rescue Coalition, we exist to provide some hope in this area. Uh, we really do believe we're making a difference by identifying many, many predators who would have then gone on to abuse many more children. So we hope that we've put a stop to, to a lot of this from happening. Um, but I also really believe that through education, through really talking to your children about like scenarios that could happen and, and just what their reactions should be. Um, if you're a parent who cares and loves your child and, you know, is concerned about this and you are, are looking out for your child and making sure that they're safe, then that's a lot better off than a lot of children are in this world who don't have a parent who's looking out for them. And unfortunately that's what predators target oftentimes is who's that child that's, you know, nobody is really checking in on or, mm -hmm. or paying attention to. So I do like to think that having all these things that we're armed with education, law enforcement being effective um, and, and, good parents who, who are protecting their children, that we were putting our children in a much safer spot than a lot of children, unfortunately, are left in. Well, I am really grateful for you spending time with me today and, and sharing this. And obviously for the work you do, um, we will find you online at Child Rescue Coalition. I know that's your hashtag, or not your hashtag, your uh, handle on Instagram. Tell us about some things that are coming up, Carly, that we can keep an eye out for. And even if people wanted to be involved in so much as donating time or money, like tell us all the places where we can connect with you. Yeah, I just wanted to, well, maybe I mentioned it already, but this is our 10th year as our, a nonprofit organization. So super excited. This December will be, um, our official tenure, uh, but we are able to exist, keep this technology free to law enforcement because individual supporters and donors have been able to be so generous to support this. They believe in it too. And so we couldn't appreciate them more. Um, so if any of your viewers or listeners want to support, please go to childrescuecoalition.org. Sign up for our newsletter, which will let you know about cases that we've just worked on, new campaigns that we're launching. Uh, we even have this exciting part of um, April is Child Abuse Prevention Month. Uh, we have a whole way on our website where you can contact your local representative to encourage them, so your local politician, to write them a letter to say, hey, this is a crime type that matters to me and I want you to do even more to send funding, send resources that law enforcement needs to be able to do more about this. Um, so please go online to our website and, and write a letter to your local politician through our website. Also, our education blog uh, gives a lot of resources for parents and tips to how to keep your kids safe and what you can be doing online. 
This is very necessary information. And guys, I, I highly encourage you to check out their website. Their social media is also like their Instagram page is a great source of information. I often find that Carly, even by following groups like yours, even if you're not engaged daily in the thought of, you know, reminding your kid of this or that, you get that scroll, you're scrolling through and get that reminder when we see a post on your account every so often. Okay. Like this is, it's just even to follow on social media. It's just, it provides that impetus to stay on top of this because this is a real thing that, um, that our, our kids and any kid could potentially face. So, you know, even that is, it's just such a good following. You guys have tons of good information and resources always linked on your social as well. So we will be continuing to follow. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate you just wanting to talk about this. It can be a hard topic to cover, but again, we hope we're bringing some help, hope to a, a dark issue. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time, Carly. And thank you guys. If you've been watching live or listening to the podcast, thank you so much. Like I say, these, these topics are big, but you know, we can't run away from difficult. And, um, I hope this has inspired you to have a conversation with your children or educate yourself in in some way that can, um, that can make this, this a little better for everyone. So Check out the blog. As always, we go through um, all of our amazing guests and post recaps on the blog. That's wegotatalk.com slash blog. Leave a rating and review. If you haven't already done that, that's just right there on Apple Podcasts. That actually makes a huge difference and gets these episodes out to people who might find them helpful. And especially on topics like this, guys, let's just spread the word on this as much as possible. And that's it. We'll be back next week with more uh, good information here on We Gotta Talk. Thank you again for hanging here. And we'll see you guys next week.